Good morning, McNabb, and welcome to this morning's worship. We begin this morning by acknowledging the sad news that Jan Bernhardt's husband, Bob, passed away this past Wednesday. Jan attends our 1030 traditional service. Her husband, Bob, was also Reverend Dr. Bob Bernhardt, a Presbyterian minister who, even in his retirement, continued as stated supply minister at Alberton Presbyterian Church. So this has been a loss within our church family and our presbytery. Bob also had a significant role in mentoring me. So our prayers go up for Jan and her family and our friends in Alberton. The Psalmist in Psalm 27 tells us, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Emily Colbert will now sing for us, Lord of all hopefulness. She is accompanied by Gerald Smink. Thanks, Emily and Gerald. Let's join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christina will now share with us Kid Zone. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, church. Good morning, choir. 
Good morning, friends. Happy Sunday, everyone. As always, I hope that you had a good week this past week. The sun was shining, and I hope that you had an opportunity to get outside and enjoy it and just feel the sunshine on your skin and just feel your heart lifting up because I don't know about you, but being out in the sun makes my heart very happy. Do you know what else makes my heart happy? If you guess T, you would guess right, but actually today that's not what I'm thinking of. Today, I'm thinking of spending time with my friends. Spending time with my friends and being around people makes my heart very, very happy. I have one friend in particular, her name is Zan. She's very special to me and I don't have an opportunity to see her as often as I would like. But when I'm around her, I always feel happy in my heart. One thing that Zan is really good at, she's good at a lot of things, but one thing that she's really good at is listening. Isn't that a funny thing to think about being good at? It is kind of, but it's true. She's really good at listening. She doesn't get distracted and she doesn't look around at other things or play on her phone. She's really good at listening when we're talking and knowing that she's hearing what I'm saying and understanding makes my heart feel happy. It makes me feel like she really cares about me and that she really loves me. She does other things that make me feel that way too, but listening is just one of them. Did you know that the Bible talks about being a good listener? It does. Do you remember a couple weeks ago when I was lost on the hiking trail and I talked about our Bible being a book full of really good information that helps us to be good friends and good members of the community? Well, this is an example of that. In the book of James, the Bible tells us that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That means that we should spend most of our time listening, we should think about what we say before we say it, and we should pause and think about our actions before we get angry. That's great information for being a good friend and a good member of your family and a good member of the community. Can you think of someone in your family or in your friend, in your class, or maybe on a team, can you think of someone who's a really good listener? This week, I want you to be a really good listener, and I want to encourage you to just see what you can do, to focus on what people are saying, and so that you can be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Have a great week, guys. I'll see you next time. Ian is going to share with us before he reads our scripture this morning. Thanks, Christina, and good morning, everyone. I was privileged to be born into a Christian family towards the end of the Great Depression. I had no reluctance in going as a child to St. James Bond Church in Toronto. My dad was the inspired principal of the Sunday school, several hundred of us came World War II. Our home often hosted uniformed relatives and others on their way to the training or the front. The church was a center of caring, hope, and strength. We knew no alternative. Then tragedy struck. At age 10, my mom died at home of breast cancer to be followed two years later with cancer also afflicting my dad. A really low point for me was when a relative promised miraculous recovery by the, delaying, by the laying on of a white handkerchief dampened with holy water from Jerusalem. When there was no improvement, his verdict was harsh. Why did God let this happen? Jesus loves me? God sees the sparrow fall? Really? Why did he blink? Why did I do, what did I do to deserve this? The church was supportive. The greatest comfort came from my minister. If my parents were made of brass and steel, they might last forever, but could they give us love? Only flesh and blood can show us love. God's gift to us is the capacity to show love to others as we would want to be loved. The cost, 
may be pain and tribulation. The reward is life eternal. Life eternal. I did stay with the church. Fortuitously, I met Shirley there. Opportunities opened for us as if by divine intervention. Decades later, after many moves, McNabb Street Presbyterian received us with the same warmth and caring that we witnessed at St. James Bond, offering us many opportunities to share our talents and time. In this time of COVID-19, we may feel that we are being tested, but we will come back as before. This morning, we will conclude our series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, keeping in mind Paul's words in Galatians 5, commencing at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and finally self-control. As we consider this ninth fruit of self-control, let us consider Paul's teaching in Ephesians 4.21. For surely you have heard about him, and were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Thanks very much, Ian. What does exercising self-control mean for you? For some, it means not losing their temper, especially when somebody's trying to push their buttons. Maybe it's resisting the pull to do something you know you shouldn't. Maybe there's a plate of cookies in the room right now, and you know you're only supposed to eat one. Or maybe it's more on the proactive side of cultivating good habits and good self-discipline. For the purpose of today's message, I suggest it's about making choices that reflect God's love and resisting choices that are contrary to God's love. How does the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and specifically this fruit of self-control, come out in one's life? I've mentioned throughout this whole series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit that this fruit doesn't just appear out of nowhere, perhaps the way I perceive fruit to grow on a tree. Instead, this fruit is more like an outcome that involves our participation, like when we use the phrase, the fruit of one's labors. The language of outcomes appears in Galatians 6, just after Paul talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and affirms again that we are to be active participants. In this case, Paul uses the language of sowing and reaping. He says, you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Us sowing is about us having a part in this. And our ongoing participation in these outcomes is emphasized when Paul says, so let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. That's a pretty clear call to action on our part. Jesus doesn't invite us just to believe. He invites us to follow him, to pattern our lives after him through our choices. The very term self-control implies that we have a part in this. Ian just read for us Paul's description of two different selves. One that we are to put away. That is the self that resists self-control. The other we're to put on or clothe ourselves with. That is the self that embraces self-control. Let me read part of that again. Paul says in Learning Christ, you were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Note the verbs describing our role, our choices. Put away the old self that which doesn't exercise self-control. Clothe yourselves with the new self, that part that does exercise self-control. And the passage moves on from there to give concrete examples of what this might mean, what it might look like. In each case, we're told not just to stop one thing, but also to start another, replace it with another. Again, put away the old, 
put on the new. Paul in verse 25 talks about putting away falsehood. And in place of that, let all of us speak truth to our neighbors. Verse 28, he says, thieves must give up stealing and replace it by laboring and working honestly. Verse 29, he says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths. In place, only what is useful for building up. Verse 31, he says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. And in place, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. At the end of this section, Paul finishes with the incentive to make these choices. It comes at the end of his final example of forgiving one another and is the incentive that we have for putting on the new self. And here it is. God in Christ has forgiven you. Please don't see this putting away the old, clothing yourself with the new, as some future pass-fail test that is or isn't going to get you into God's good books. Like eternal life is something up for grabs, depending on how well you do. This isn't about earning God's favor, but rather living in the light of already receiving God's favor. Even the Ten Commandments, when they were given in the Old Testament, were given in that context. Before the Ten Commandments were given, God tells his people this. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then the Ten Commandments follow. The order, I think, is crucial, because basically God tells them, I am your God, and I have already rescued you. In light of that, here is how you should live. Not, here are some requirements, we'll see how you do keeping them, and then I'll decide whether or not I'm going to be your God. No, I've already demonstrated that I'm committed to your best interests by rescuing you from Egypt. These commandments follow with what is in your best interests. You are already my people. This is how you should live. Similarly, self-control isn't about us earning God's favor. Jesus' death and resurrection has already established that for us. But self-control is living in the light of having already received God's favor. A parent hands the car keys, their car keys, to their 17-year-old who had no part in providing the vehicle. But the keys are freely given. But they also come with an expectation about how the car is to be driven. A loving parent provides the keys to the car. That same loving parent makes it clear that there are expectations in light of getting those keys. What we receive freely from God carries with it responsibility. In another place, Jesus made this invitation. He says, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What a great invitation to receive rest from our burdens, rest from our sin. But Jesus continues in the very next verse with these words, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. A yoke harnessed two oxen together, meaning that they are now heading in the same direction. To take on Jesus' yoke is to choose his direction for my life. Yes, the burdens of sin come off your back, but Jesus' yoke goes around your neck informing the direction you take and the choices that follow. Being handed the keys to the car doesn't mean that you get to drive the car carelessly with no responsibility. Why? Because a parent wants their child to succeed driving. They want what is best for their child. There is a yoke of responsibility, self-control, that comes with embracing Jesus' offer because God wants what is best for us. Embracing the choices of self-control is to embrace God's best. Conversely, not exercising self-control often works against experiencing God's best. So if self-control is about God's best, why do we struggle with that choice? Because the alternative always offers us a momentary reward, an immediate payoff. 
but it is always at the expense of the long-term good. That's why choosing between the two is a struggle. Lack of self-control offers me a short-term payoff now, but always at the expense of a long-term good over time. Go back to the list of examples that we looked at in Ephesians 4. Considering the short-term payoffs that come with those things where we don't choose self-control, those things that we're supposed to let go of. Take falsehood, for example. He says we're to put off falsehood, lying. Why would we choose to lie in the first place? Because it always offers us a short-term payoff now, perhaps avoiding the blame for something. But it is always at the cost of usually having to tell more lies, eventually being found out. He says that we're to give up stealing. Why are we tempted to steal? It's usually because we want something that we don't have and we want it right now. But the long-term loss from that is we're always looking over our shoulder to see who is close to catching us. Not to mention we have to live with the awareness that we've harmed someone else by stealing. He says no evil talk. Why is that tempting? Because it often makes us feel like we have power over others. But again, that feeling, pretty short-lived. He says, put away from you all bitterness. Why is that tempting? Again, on some level, and certainly in the short term, it makes you feel justified over unfair treatment you may have suffered. And I'm not saying that you may not have been legitimately wronged by others, but the long-term cost of buying into bitterness is being perpetually miserable. It robs you of the long-term good. Those, and you could fill in other examples, illustrate for us how lack of self-control dangles temporary payoffs before us, but always at the expense of the long-term good. That's why God invites us to participate in choices that cultivate self-control, because he is committed to our long-term good and our best interests. As we conclude this series, maybe you're feeling like, Steve, this self-control thing, I've got a long way to go. And if you're thinking that, all I can tell you is get in line behind me. But if we do have a long way to go, perhaps our question ought to be, what is my next step going to be in that long way? Paul gives us a list of examples of how I can put away one thing and clothe myself with another. And perhaps this morning, rather than being overwhelmed by everything, let's choose one thing and try to take that one step. With regard to this fruit of the Spirit, none of us have fully arrived yet. But please keep this in mind. Fruit takes time to ripen. When I go apple picking each fall, it's for the purpose of reaping, if you will, fruit that is fully ripened. If I were to go to that same orchard earlier in the year, I would see that the apples were certainly less than what they were yet to become. But I wouldn't for a moment say that they weren't apples. I would simply acknowledge that they are still on the path to full maturity. Please remember that. Please take comfort in that as you patiently consider whatever next step you have to take on the path that you're on today. Would you join with me now in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for being at work in our lives. Help us, Lord, to consider our participation and what our next step will be in seeking to put away the old and put on the new. Thank you that what you began in our lives, you will bring to full maturity. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, peace, and comfort today. Father, as we mourn Bob's passing, we especially pray this peace upon Jan and her family. And we also join with Jan in her thanks that Bob did not suffer, having grateful hearts for a life well lived. Now, Father, we pause in silence to lift up others who are hurting and need a sense of your presence, your peace, and your comfort right now. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Christina will now share with us a brief announcement about our upcoming small groups. Quick announcement from me. 
If you haven't yet filled out your survey about small groups and you think that you might like to participate in small groups, it's not too late. The link is in the email from Steve. I'd really appreciate it if you could just take two seconds to fill it out. It just lets me know what days and what times work best for you and the best way to get in touch with you. We've had a great response so far. It looks like we're actually going to have more than one small group. So don't be shy. I'm really looking forward to spending this time with you guys. Thanks, Christina. Following our service this morning, we are also going to have a communion service using whatever you have for bread and wine where you are at home. It'll be a separate video. If you're with us on the Facebook watch party this morning, the video will be set to play about five minutes after this service finishes. And when this service is finished, simply close the video. The communion video will be listed on our Facebook page to premiere shortly. If you're on our website, again, we will have a separate video that you can play independent of our worship service. Our Zoom Coffee Fellowship will start five minutes later this morning at 10.50. And if you need the link or you're not receiving regular email updates, write me right after this service at nabstreet at gmail.com. And now may the Lord go before you to lead you. May the Lord go behind you to protect you. May the Lord go beneath you to support you. May the Lord go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord together. Amen. Thanks, Steve. We invite you now to just spend some time reflecting as we listen to a postlude from Gerald. <laughs> 